this is the theme of our journey this week as it was last and will be for the next two. Asking the question, what if? Now that was said in the context uh, of a, 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 a commercial that I saw. Actually, we had named the title of the series before I saw the commercial, but the commercial really sort of put the exclamation point on it. And I was watching it, and I saw it as a Citibank, and it had this older gentleman, probably in his late 50s, who, who was walking out of the grocery store. And as he was leaving, pushing his cart, he kind of looks around for a second, and then he does it. He steps up on his cart, and he rides that grocery cart across the parking lot. And i got to say thank you to many of you this week who took my challenge, and you rode your grocery carts and took pictures and sent them to us. And I, I've posted some of those. If you go on our uh, Facebook page, you'll see them. And I thought, and the commercial said, what if? What if a, a bank, which is what City is, what if a bank could get, make us feel more of this? And I thought, that's it, but, but not so much a bank, of course. Instead, a, a church. What if our faith, what if, if our walk with Christ could make us feel more of this? You know, that just that sort of that abandon, that joyous opportunity to say, what if, and the possibilities, and to, to have, as the Scriptures say, the joy of God's salvation restored in us. What if? So we're talking about that for these next few weeks. And I asked last week, what if we pray? And I asked that question to many of you in, in some personal conversation. And I spoke with Carolyn Day. And Carolyn leads one of our prayer groups called The Prayer Force on Thursday mornings at 6.30 a.m. here at the church. And yes, God is awake at that hour. And she shared some of her experiences in prayer and so I invited her, I said, Carolyn, can I sit down and talk with you? Can we interview you and, and, and you share that? And so she said yes. And so we sat down and, and taped our conversation. And I want to thank Paul McVicker and uh, Chris Williams, who've done so much to help put that together. And I want you to take a look at what her responses were. My grandson was going to be born. We found out that uh, he had gastros gastrosis and that's the inflammation of uh, it's where all his intestines were outside of his body and some of his major organs and so uh, it was a hard time for our family and I knew I needed to be strong so I went to the prayer group and they were so great they were so great I just um, I came one time uh, he'd been in after he was born he was in the NICU for 29 days and so I would come to the prayer group as often as I could, but sometimes we would have to stay up there and take care of the, the other child. After he came home, we came back, but then his intestines, uh, part of his intestine rotted, and it had to be expelled, and we thought he was going to die. And so I went back to the prayer group. I told him, well, I might cry during the whole thing. I might cry for the whole prayer time, and it's usually an hour and 45 minutes. And they said, that's okay, just go ahead, it's all right. And so we prayed for everybody on the list, and we, and we prayed for Brian. And a lot of times we lay hands on people when they're really having a hard time. And uh, they lay their hands on me, and we prayed for Brian, and I cried and cried and cried. And it was really good. But it gave me hope, and it gave me peace. God really showed me the ropes. And it, it wasn't like it changed a whole lot of things. It made, Brian did get well but it gave me the strength that I needed. When I was a little girl, I, um, we didn't go to church a whole lot, but we always said the blessing and we prayed and um, it was like, now I lean down to sleep kind of prayer. And, um, and so I prayed that I would do well on a test or that I'd, uh, you know, I'd make friends because I was a military brat and that was a big deal. But then my grandma, Granny, she was a, an invalid, and she stayed in her bed all the time, and she could only, she couldn't speak. She had Parkinson's, and I think she'd have a stroke, and she could only blink her eyes. And so I prayed for her to um, get well, because, you know, God helped me on the test, and he helped me make friends, and, you know, kind of stuff like that. But, uh, but she didn't get well, and she lived to be very, very old, in her 80s, 86 or something. But God didn't change that situation, but he changed me. And so I think a lot of times God is either telling me to wait or he's telling me to uh, just hang in there. 
or he helps you through it. And sometimes he says yes. So it's not like a magic thing where you say, dear God, bring me a friend or, or help me do well. And if you study, you'll do well. <laughs> but, um, but he helps you deal with it. And he gives, well, my daughter, she grew up, she did, did a lot of growing up in this church and she's had a lot of great people that helped her grow in her spiritual life. And uh, she said, mom, I'm not praying for God to make Brian well. I'm praying to want what he wants. So she was praying for God's will. And that was a big lesson to me that, um, that we should, we've got to put God first. We've got to put God first and do what his will is. That's what we want. Yeah. Carolyn's daughter said, I'm not praying for God to make Brian well. I'm praying to want what he wants. She was praying for God's will, Carolyn said. Carolyn also said that she learned that from her daughter. That is, that we've got to put God first. And what God's will is, that's what we want or what we should want. And I appreciate that so very much. You see, Carolyn talked about praying in two different circumstances. She prays in all circumstances, I suspect, but in those two that she had described, of her grandson and her grandmother. And in one case, he was healed and things changed. In the other, she wasn't healed in the way that we would have maybe asked or thought, but what God's will was. And that's what it comes down to. Asking, my, not your will, just as Jesus prayed that night in the garden, not my will be done, but yours, O Lord. What if, then, what if we seek God first? What if we pray, and what if we seek God? Matthew six thirty three says, Strive first for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all of these things, then, will be given to you as well. You see, the challenge for me in that scripture text, and for probably all of us, is this. Personally, sometimes when we read the text, we think, okay, if I seek God first, then whatever I want after can be given to me. I'll have it. There's something I struggle with in this circle of, of thinking, in this faith experience. It's the, if A, then B, right? It's if, if I want it, then God will give it if I seek God first about it. But that's what oftentimes is called prosperity theology. God wants you to be well and wealthy, according to that theological thinking. The wealth and health gospel, it's sometimes referred to. Now, get, don't get me wrong. There's nothing inherently wrong with being both well and healthy, or, or, and wealthy. But thanks be to God that we have those blessings if we do. Give thanks for them. But to base our theology on that is as far away from what the good news and the gospel that Jesus preaches is. Granted, prosperity preachers usually don't have much trouble attracting the large followers to this because it's appealing to the basest of our human instincts, as I see it. The desire to avoid suffering, which would be health, and the desire for gratification, wealth. I mean, who doesn't want that? Not to be in pain and to have all that we want and need. Yet Jesus came, came into the world and said, I, yes, come to give you life and to give it to you in the full. But we have to ask, what is to be full? I must be careful of those who encourage me to believe that God wants me to have my life full of stuff. Then I have, if I do, I have a life that is full of it, stuff. And sometimes my wife does say that I'm full of it, for sure. But we have to be careful about what it is that we pray about. Hayden Shaw, a guy that uh, we, uh, Ron and Fontenot and I, had an opportunity to go and hear this week, said that in the corporate world, you wouldn't work below your pay grade because that's not good for a good use of resources. Or in the military life, you wouldn't work below your rank because that's not effective leadership. But Christ followers follow an example of the one who was the most important washing feet. We as Christ followers hear these words, when we seek to be those who are first, we will be last. If we strive to be last, we will be served first. We serve a king who served. 
we worship a God, a Savior who humbled himself even unto death. So I ask, what is fullness of life? Is it full of stuff or full of Christ? But I can see how we might want to think about this idea of seeking God first and then whatever I want being added. It's definitely a definition that we could give for the fullness of life and life being full, full of joys and toys. Who doesn't want that? But I want us to think about this a little more deeply. So I went deeper into one of the original texts about this seeking first. You might know it. It's from Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. It is the first of the Ten Commandments. And we hopefully know what that is, but if you don't, it's this. You shall not have any other gods before me. <laughs> now, there's a footnote on that word before in the text. And the footnote says, if you look down at the bottom, it says that this text could also read, you shall have no other gods beside me, or you shall have no other gods other than me. And then I read that and I thought, what? Wait, what? Wait a minute, hold on. That seems to me to be an awfully big difference. I mean, we need to get this clear. Beside me or before me, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt have no other gods other than me. There's a big difference in those folks. I needed to investigate this. So when you study the word of the origin of Hebrews, you'll realize that there is no word in the original text for the English word that we translate as before. In the concordance, when I looked it up, this word before, there was a blank in the reference. No reference in the Hebrew for before. There's no words. We put that word there. In the Orthodox Hebrew Bible, it says this, Thou shalt have no Elohim Archim in my presence. Elohim is the name of God. Archim is other or other than, or others, another. So what the text really should say, say is, you shall have no other gods other than me. Darn it. I kind of like that other one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So I can worship God, capital G, and then I can have all those other little g gods that I want to worship in life. Right? As long as they just don't come before God. But that's not what the text said. Hayden Shaw at the conference, again, that Ron and I attended, said this. The church is not so good with people who have freedom, who have choice, and who have change in their lives. What I think he meant by this was that as the church, we're not very good at leading people to know how to engage the gift of freedom, the gift of choice, and the gift of change in their lives for kingdom building. What does it mean to resource my freedom, to resource my choices that I have, to resource the opportunities that change brings in my life for the glory of God and the love and light of Christ Jesus in this world? What does it mean to put God first? Even at our best, we realize that Scripture teaches us that we are not what God has created us to be. That is why one of the words in the Scripture for sin is hamarita, which means missing the mark. We miss the mark. When I try to seek the kingdom of God first, I often miss. I make mistakes. I fail at it. But that doesn't mean I shouldn't keep trying. We all have to keep trying. All of our talents all of our skills, all of our time, all that we are and hope to be, all our freedom and choice and change should be directed at God. We are not the mothers, though, that we ought to be, the fathers that we hope to be, the citizens that we wish to be, the churchmen, the ministers, the soldiers of Christ. We all fall short and miss the mark and disappoint God, even at our best. You might call that sin, original sin, Whatever it is that hinders us, I often don't seek God first. Henry David Thoreau described Walden's Pond this way. He wrote, Walden is blue and at one time and green at another. And he says, even from the same point of view, lying between the earth and the heavens, it partakes the colors of both. 
What Thoreau's words are describing is you and me as well as Walden Pond. When we too partake of life, we partake of the colors of both heaven and earth, of both sin and our humanity. This sad truth presents a dilemma for our creator. God has made us to be clay, uh, uh, from clay of the earth, and has fashioned us into the image of God and has breathed into us the breath of life and has given to us freedom and opportunity and choices and change in our lives that we might do something great, but often we fail to do that. More significantly, God has endowed us with the most precious gift of all, the free will to choose, but unfortunately we choose wrongly many times. J.K. Chesterton says in observation that whatever else is true about humans, it is certainly true that man is not what he was meant to be. Will Rogers (laughs) once was asked, what is wrong with the world? He said, I don't know. With that drawl, he also went on and said, I guess it's people. On another occasion, he said, God made man a little lower than the angels, and man has been getting lower ever since. Mark Twain once said, man is the creature made at the end of the work week when God was tired. We are created by God we are created for just such a time as this the challenge though is in our humanity we so often take the road that is of least resistance the easier path we choose the earthly worldly temptations and we choose to take what God has given to us and seek not first the kingdom but the world and we try to squeeze the kingdom in wherever it can I, uh, I used to be a coach for Zach's soccer team and Devin's baseball team. I was a really lousy coach for Zach's soccer team because I never played soccer. And when Zach started playing, I just learned as much as I could by watching videos and reading books. And I'd get out there, and it was really easy when they were really small because all they did was play what Becky calls amoeba soccer. And that's like if the ball is the nucleus, the kids just all sort of like a little amoeba move all over the fields. They just follow the ball as this clump that sort of changes shape like an amoeba. But then eventually they get better at it, you know, and they start asking, well, am I going to play halfback or fullback or am I a striker or goal? I'm like, what is that? I, I have no idea. So I went and learned what this is all about, and I teach them. I wasn't very good at that. Zach was a, was a good soccer player, but we, we knew that that wasn't going to be the career thing. Now it's Devin. Devin played baseball. And, and I played baseball. I pitched. I, I, I thought I was pretty good as, as a farm kid. And, and so we played baseball, and I taught Devin and Sean, the, another dad, and I coached. And, and we'd get these kids out there, and I'm thinking, oh, Devin, he's pretty good. He's got some natural talent, you know. And, and these delusions of grandeur begin to, to seep into me as a father. And so every year you want to make sure he's got the best. So we'd go to the, to the store, and, and they'd get their baseball equipment, right, and a new helmet every year, batting gloves, cleats, the, the, the bats. And, and do you know you could spend $500 on a baseball bat? or more and and these were by you know it's like oh, i gotta get this bat data because he's i'm gonna be great and i'm like yeah you are you're gonna play for the cubs someday so yeah let's get that bat and and you're spending all this you know and it's crazy and you're thinking well he might not he might not make a whole lot of money but uh, but 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 maybe he'll at least get a scholarship and if he gets a scholarship he can get in college and then that'll be we'll have it made i i, I got to pay for school and i don't have a lot of money so that'd be awesome and we we think about this and so they seek first those things you ever get a place where you go from preaching to meddling I'm going to meddle just a little bit you know, one of the things Shaw and I'll finish with this Shaw also said he says you know it god has created us for such a time as this but god did not give to us health and wealth and all that we have in our lives whatever it is so that we could use it for ourselves. he didn't give you health and wealth if you have it so that we when you retire you could go and play golf for the next 30 years ouch didn't give you the opportunities that you have now so that you could just do what you want with it for yourself I w- wanted to go to Indianapolis this week. The uh, band, marching band, you may know, was there for the Bands of America National Grand National Championships in Indianapolis. And 
but I wasn't able to go. I had too many other things, and commitments, a uh, conference that we were going to, things Saturday, and of course here today. And so I didn't go. And I appreciated that Shaw said in his uh, presentation also, you know, it's important for us to teach our families that sometimes it's good to give ourselves to something more than our families. Permission. I was feeling really guilty. I still am in some ways that I didn't spend the however much money it was going to take me to go and be there in Indianapolis for Zach for the band competition. But sometimes we can't always be present. See, I think even in some ways we've made family number one. Disney has taught us to worship the family. And family's important, don't get me wrong, absolutely. But that's not what God said to seek first. He said seek first the kingdom and then those other things will come and i don't stand up here and be the even attempt to be the one who says i'm without sin so i can make decisions about how your life is lived because i have my own but here's what i want to invite us to to say what if what if we seek first the kingdom in a way in our own lives that we ask god how are you leading me to seek you first and then what else will then come in order for me to do that and for you to ask that question between you and God, where am I not putting you first? And what would that look like in my life? I'm asking that in mine and wondering what it would look like as we pray. Let's pray together.